fantasy short stories. Of Portals and Portents by Leslie Heron. Chapter 7, Augalite. Crouched between the filthy curtains of a vacated house, Eric all but pushed his face against the grimy window. He squinted through the dusty surface to get a better look at one of the gleaming copper robots that trundled down the road outside. While their overall structure was crude and bulky, the ingenuity was outstanding. And the amount of detail was so unique that each one could be identified as a separate entity instead of mass-produced units. One was wearing a sash over its chest that matched a neat beret on its tiny head, several shiny metals clinking noisily in time as it moved. Another one rolled by wearing a chef's hat and a fake waxed mustache. It was a pity they were all currently trying to murder him and his counterpart. Eric's thoughts were interrupted as another machine came around the corner, turning in his direction. A hand grabbed his shoulder and yanked him back, hard, sending him to the floor. Get away from the window, you moron, Tragedy growled, relinquishing his hold on the doctor. He peeked between the moldy curtains in time to see the robot lose interest and resume its search. I take it you were terrible at hide-and-seek as a child, weren't you? He has a point. With a cough, Eric pushed himself to his knees. I'm not a moron. Oh, remind him what your QI big brain number is. That always seems to help. He adjusted his glasses on his face with a petulant huff and gave the front of his shirt a quick dusting. I'm sorry, okay? It's just, I've been stuck in this world for so long. Eric shifted his gaze to the king. Abra is great and all, but... People here are still struggling with the concept of indoor plumbing. He pulled a face when he noticed a sparkle of understanding from his doppelganger. This is the first higher form of technology I've seen. It's, well, it's fascinating. If I had to pick a brain number, it would be seven. That's a good number. My favorite number. Elias pinched the bridge of his nose and collapsed into a wooden chair. Yes, yes. They're wonderful. Perhaps when this is all said and done, I'll help you build your own. But now is not the right moment to be ogling the death machines. He pushed the tips of his fingers into either side of his temples, massaging them gently. Their daring escape had been short-lived, as the initial robot had managed to alert its compatriots. Within moments, more had arrived— it took all their agility and cunning to duck into this meager structure, but it would only be a matter of time before they were discovered. He looked up. If your intent is to leave this city, we need to formulate a plan of action. Climbing to his feet, Eric gave one last wistful glance over his shoulder before he began to pace. Okay, they mistook me for you. So it's probably safe to assume their kill-the-king-on-sight protocol is based off facial recognition. He tapped thoughtfully against his chin. And, since it took that robot longer to notice me, that leads me to believe they are extremely detail-oriented. A fact we can exploit. That's a fair assumption. Elias leaned back, causing the wooden chair to groan in protest. Are you going somewhere with this, or are you just speculating? Eric's mouth quirked in a grin. We simply just have to fool their protocols. As in... as in, change our faces. Why didn't I think of that? Tragedy was the first to shake his head. Oh, right. Because it's a dumb idea. Eric waved the bodyguard off without even acknowledging him. He was too focused on scanning the tiny house. While it was easy to say the domicile was spatially challenged, it was filled with a great deal of stuff. There was a small table with two wooden chairs cozied up next to an ancient potbelly stove, a simple refrigerator that was leaking... something, a massive bed piled high with blankets and the day's laundry spilling out of the combination bathroom-laundry-storage closet. 
A long wooden handle poking from between the folds of clothing caught his attention, and he wrenched it free. Flipping the old mop upside down, Eric held it against his face like a beard. Ta-da! Elias rolled his eyes as he pushed his face into his hands. Did you hit your head back there? The concern creeping into his words was real, and he looked back up with a raised eyebrow. No one will believe that's real. That's what I said about a face full of tree sap and bear fur, but it worked. Eric scratched at his scruff, remembering the incessant itchiness of that experience. Honestly, I think people are a lot dumber than we give them credit for. Regardless, we aren't trying to fool the citizens, just the robots. Dragging his hand down his face... Elias suppressed the urge to sigh. He remembered a certain cyborg eluding these same robots with nothing more than a pilfered military coat. Say I was to buy into this idea. There's only one mop. How will we both pass unnoticed? I could always disguise his features the old-fashioned way. Tragedy cracked his knuckles with a wide grin. The swearing will probably last to the edge of the city. Eric was already darting around the cramped confines of the room, digging through drawers, baskets, and whatever else had been used to store clothing. Ignoring the bodyguard's comments, he jerked his head in the man's direction. You'll have to remove your mask. I'd wager that robot flagged your current appearance when you attacked it. With an irritated grumble, tragedy begrudgingly complied. He slid the porcelain visage from his face, and, after staring at it for a long moment, he set it against the windowsill. He didn't like feeling so exposed. Smiling, Eric turned back to face his doppelganger, holding up a weathered bonnet in one hand and a simple black canvas dress in the other. Would this suit you, or would you say you were more of a frills and lace kind of guy? Elias couldn't fight the spasm under his eye. I haven't known you for very long, but, and I say this with the utmost confidence, this is the dumbest idea you've ever had. I like the frilly one. They let out another grumble as he flexed his fingers. <sighs> I'm never going to get all this sand out of my joints. There was a grinding sensation between the mechanical digits that made up his hand, and he could hear the grit as it moved around within the shifting metal plates. I can assure you it's better than some... Uh, other places? Chester fidgeted on the spot. I'm not arguing that. Well gave a knowing look before pushing a finger into his irritated eye. If this was the only mechanical thing I had to worry about... He could feel the sand between each metal vertebrae that lined his back as he straightened out. Chester let out a wry chuckle as he reached for his vest. I suppose. But it is better than dying. The fire they had managed to build had done an excellent job of drying their clothing, even if it forced them to sit before it mostly naked throughout the night. He began fastening the buttons as he turned to face the ruinous mess that was once his city. From this far away, all he could make out was the fractured plate that held Ava's isle, and his face fell. It was a dark indication of what he would find. Vel followed his gaze as he reached for his own shirt. Careful not to dislodge the bandage on his left arm, he slid it over his head and looked back to the Prime Minister. What are you going to do? It was several moments before Chester found his words. I'll have to return and assess the damage. His heart grew heavy as he recalled the countless screams heard in the hours before dawn. He knew this wasn't his fault, but he couldn't fight the feeling that he had somehow failed his people. I'll have to rally the survivors to help find the missing, and... His voice was hollow. Tally the dead, I suppose. He knew it was selfish, given all that had transpired, but he prayed he wouldn't be adding his own family to that list. Vel clapped the man on the shoulder, 
giving it a gentle squeeze. This wasn't your doing. Don't blame yourself. He pulled away as guilt grew inside him. If Eric was at fault for this, then wouldn't he also be partially responsible? You're right, of course. Chester cleared his thoughts with a purposeful cough and fastened the last button on his vest. We should get going. Mel shook his head. I have to go find the kids. There was no hesitation in his conviction. He pushed aside the guilt and the gnawing sensation of needing to discover the culprit behind this senseless disaster to remind himself that Atticus and Piper were still out there, somewhere. That is, if they were even... Uh, no, he wouldn't allow his mind to go there. Nodding, Chester swiveled around on his heel. I figured you might. He desperately wanted the cyborg to join him in his return to the city, to have at least one able-bodied person to help him. But he knew he wouldn't convince the man otherwise. And to be honest, he was worried about the kids himself. I'm sure they're fine, but bring my children back to me. Vel scoffed. Your children? Yes, all of Avis's orphaned and wayward kids are mine. Chester smiled, but it dimmed as his gaze shifted over the still unconscious figure laying next to the fire. What about her? Mel glanced over his shoulder at the dapple-skinned woman. What about her? Appalled, Chester's mouth fell ajar. You can't just leave her here. Agreed. You take her. I'm going to be roughing it through the wilds, and she'll only slow me down. Val folded his arms over his chest. Yes, what a capital idea. Chester feigned interest, tapping his finger against his chin. Alas, I am nowhere near as strong or as capable as you are. His face formed a line. Capable? I've got a hole in my arm. Mel pointed at it with dramatic emphasis. Chester took several steps back, clicking his tongue against his teeth. Tough break, old chap. I'm sure you'll figure it out. He took another several steps back. I have to go. My, well, my people need me. He gave a half-salute before turning on his heel and darting off in the direction of Avis. Flabbergasted? Vel watched as the Prime Minister sprinted away from him at a speed he had only witnessed the man achieve once. With a roll of his eyes, he turned back to look down at the woman. As far as he and Amy could tell, she hadn't sustained any serious injuries, mostly just scrapes and bruises. Chester had helped bandage several of her cuts with some of the many shawls she had been found in. Her clothes were obviously foreign, ornate and richly dyed, speckled with gemstones. She had even been adorned in expensive jewelry. This wasn't a fashion Belle had ever seen in Avis before. Was it possible she was an inhabitant of the world they had collided with? He was about to reach for her when he remembered his wounded arm. Vel flexed it gently, experimenting with his range of motion. Given the lack of pain, the damage must have only been surface deep, despite how awful it had looked when he bandaged it. He turned his attention back to the woman and sighed. All right, I guess I'm taking you with me. He reached down and pulled her from the sand, slinging her over his shoulder. Amy, any chance you can guess which direction I should head? If you mean, can I determine the most likely flight path and extrapolate a possible impact point based off the average flight speed of a Class Three pleasure craft cross-reference with the recorded velocity of the storm's expansion, then yes, I can make a guess. A digital outline display flared to life in his vision, whereas AI had managed to map some of the surroundings in their fall. Vel reached up, rubbing at the irritated eye when it flickered several times. The malfunction was likely due to the grit. But eventually, a simple arrow appeared and pointed him in the direction he needed to go. 
He shoveled sand over the fire with his boot before setting off into the forest. Elias couldn't be sure if it was the sheer chaos unraveling in the streets, or if Eric had been right that people simply weren't all that observant. But traveling as an elderly couple in the company of their grandson, they had marched along the city without so much as a sideways glance. Come on, people! Move aside! Aside! He pressed himself up against a building, turning his face away as a group of Avis troops forced their way down the busy street. He was wearing a thin veil to obscure his features, but it wouldn't hold up on close inspection. Even this far from the epicenter of the damage, the city was crammed with terror-stricken citizens looking for missing loved ones or simply milling about in shock. Laying a hand on the king's shoulder, Eric put on a show of gently steering him back into the flow of foot traffic. Come on, dear, just a bit farther. Elias shot him a dark look. You're enjoying this, aren't you? Eric shook his head violently, the mop tied to his face, threatening to come undone as he pushed a finger to his mouth. You have to disguise your voice. People will get suspicious if you don't sound like a little old lady. Elias lifted a brow, his jaw growing tight. It was bad enough that he, the ruler of this nation, had been forced into a moth-eaten dress, but even he had his limits. Uh, uh, maybe it's better if you play the quietly reserved wife. It's uncanny how much you two actually sound like a bickering old couple. Tragedy shoved a passerby out of the way. But if you don't mind, we need to focus. The wall should be coming up soon. Just let me do the talking and we should. He pulled to a stop his mouth growing slack. Where's the wall? As the street snaked towards the main road, the iron border that had been erected around the entire city never came into view. Instead, they found it open and leading into farmland. The muddy terrain had been transformed to accommodate rice paddies, grain silos, and barns. They walked across a line of iron bricks laid into the cobblestone, marking where the border once stood, emblazoned with a plaque that read, Our strength is not in our borders, but our allies. Elias grimaced. Accustomed to the greed of other nations, the wall had been built as Avis's last line of defense. Sure, their navy was unparalleled, but with a city this size, it was impossible to stop threats from entering and wreaking havoc from within. Terrorists, spies, and so-called freedom fighters were sent to destabilize his nation. Locking the border had been the only way to keep his people safe. And now, the only thing stopping these dangerous individuals was... swampy farmland? Sharmore should be in that direction. Eric pointed roughly south across the rice fields. Come on, dear. We'll have to cut through if we want to save time. <sighs> Elias sighed and hiked up his skirts. The sun was high in the afternoon sky by the time Elias and the others walked into the tiny town of Sharmore. They were, all of them, sweaty and tired, the summer heat having baked them as they walked. Even using the ratty bonnet to fan his face and swat away the biting insects, a thick sheen of moisture still gathered on his forehead and caused his clothing to stick to his skin. Elias had hoped that eventually the swamps of Avis would taper out and give way to the lush green forests of Ebra, but the two had been ceaselessly intertwined. He sighed. The area of effect appeared to have been slightly larger than he had intended. At least out here, where the population was sparse, it would be less damaging. 
He hadn't been to this town before, only skirted along the edges, and now realized town was a misnomer. Village would have been generous for this tiny settlement. A dozen or so buildings nestled up next to the river acted as a small holding port for the Selkie tribes up north to exchange goods with their southern counterparts. Lost in thought at the odd transposition of the landscape, Elias walked right into the smelly backside of a large grazing herd animal. Much like a cow crossbred with a rhino, this lumbering beast bellowed out a sound of indignation as it shuffled a few inches away on cloven hooves. Eric, just as enthralled by their surroundings, smacked into his twin, sending the king stumbling into the midst of an entire herd of the bovine creatures. They were wandering through the town, nibbling on just about anything they could get their mouths around. Chickens ran amuck underfoot, and nearby a rooster was terrorizing several children. Sorry, this is weird. I don't remember this place being so farm-like. The door to one of the nearby buildings burst open, and a billy goat came stampeding out, chased by a harried-looking member of the king's guard. Another was attempting to coax several sheep from the main roof of the inn. There were dogs barking from the trees, and several cats shaking mud from their paws as they walked. A long-horned sheep pushed between them, calling out as it marched through the streets. A rusty bell around its neck rang noisily with each step. I think. Tragedy watched the animals go for several seconds before he looked around. I think these beasts are native to Avis. Eric scratched at his chin as he pulled the mop from his face. How wide of an area did you try to transpose? In truth, I barely understood the coding that I altered. Elias gave a sheepish shrug. But I'll admit, I seem to have overshot a bit. There was an indignant huff in the back of Eric's mind, but Wraith said nothing. He wanted to agree with the Shadowbug, to lecture the king about the recklessness of his actions once again, but frankly, it was hard to focus on anything other than the nude woman who had just fled from the small two-story building being chased by several chickens. There was a long, stagnant pause as each member of the group scrabbled to find the words. Aw, come back! I told ya, I didn't summon the chickens! Eric turned back to the rundown building at the sound of a familiar voice. Atlas was standing on the last step, buck naked, with his usual bathrobe flapping in the wind, calling after the woman. Before he could wave down the arcanist, he was gone, ducking back into the building. Pushing his fingers into his temples, Elias closed his eyes. Let me guess. He dropped his hand with a lofty gesture at the building. That's who we're here to see? Uh, yeah, that'd be Atlas. Eric let out a nervous chuckle. I figured this was the closest, uh, brothel on this side of the river. Okay. Elias wasn't mentally prepared for the antics of a sex-crazed arcanist and the sudden appearance of farmland and animals. He turned to his bodyguard. Tragedy, rally the king's guard and get them helping the civilians instead of herding livestock, please. He sighed heavily. Apparently we have an appointment with a nude mage. The two men entered the establishment, whose embellished wooden sign denoted it as the Mermaid's Kiss, to find a low-lit entry room. An exasperated man, sitting behind a table, gave them a curious look. Welcome to the... His automatic speech fell away as he scrutinized them further. The aura give me strength. It's going to be one of those days. He reached for a set of keys, pushing them across the table. That'll be thirty gold pieces. What? Elias glanced down, suddenly very aware of his state of attire. 
Red in the face, he hauled the mud-stained dress over his head and tossed it away. You misunderstand. We're here for the Arcanist. Yeah, that makes sense. The gentleman snatched back the keys and jabbed a thumb over his shoulder. Second door on the left. Nodding their thanks, the two men headed down the hall and pushed their way into the room. There wasn't enough alcohol in both realms to wash away the image inside. Atlas was sprawled out across a furry blanket, his robe flung open and unashamed. One arm was thrown around a scantily clad woman, and the other around an equally undressed man. The two were taking turns feeding him bits of fruit and cheese from a platter laid out across his bare chest. Eric's mouth fell ajar when he realized... All three of them were laying on the large backside of a bear. He pushed his fingers against his forehead, shielding his eyes as Atlas leaned over to feed a bunch of grapes to Barry. Elias wasn't sure if he should be impressed or insulted, but he cleared his throat with a loud cough as he pushed his hands against his hips. Glancing up... Atlas went sheet white as he recognized the face staring at him in duplicate. Choking on the bits of food, he rolled off the bear and staggered backwards towards the wall. <laughs> oh, oh, you know what you're thinking? He hacked several more times as he hastily attempted to shield his shame. But it's not my fault. Eric raised an eyebrow. What's your fault? Atlas looked back and forth between the two. The animals? The crops? The weird city in the distance? Oh, uh, that. Eric scratched at his stubble before waving the arcanist off. No, we know it wasn't you. What we need is help tracking someone. Or rather, someones. So I'm not in trouble then? Atlas took a deep breath and moved over to a side table, shakily pouring himself a glass of wine. Whew, thank the goddess. He threw it back, washing down the food, and poured himself another. I thought maybe I'd gotten carried away during my second round this morning and accidentally caused all that. Eric took a steadying breath. No, no trouble. But do you think you can lend us a hand? Uh, one for me to find my brother, and one for... He threw a hand out behind him, gesturing to the king. Him to find his wife. Atlas flopped back down on Barry, the back of his head landing expertly in the lap of the almost naked man. Sorry, but no. Dragging a hand down his face, Eric willed away his frustration. You wouldn't even have to leave... We just need you to perform a tracking spell. It will take like five minutes of your time. Atlas waggled a finger back and forth. How many times do we have to go over this? He sat up, his drink in danger of spilling. Any spell cast by me would just take you back to Varen. Or maybe this one here, considering he's your duplicate? He turned his narrow gaze on the king. And unless you're related to your wife... No judgment from me, by the way. It would be a waste of magic. He took a long gulp of his wine before turning back to the doctor. I appreciate all that you've done for me, but I can't help you. I can only do a simple blood binding. You need an actual tracking mage. The kind, you know, you find in Still Harbor and not here. Crestfallen, Eric's shoulders slumped. Well... Can you help us find a tracking mage, then? As I recall, you said most of them are charlatans. It would be useful to have someone who could sift through the lies. No can do, I'm afraid. He leaned over, drawing a finger along the woman's chin and sending her into a fit of giggles. A bit preoccupied right now. Elias stepped forward, his fingers flexing. Perhaps you simply need the right encouragement. Whoa, whoa! Hey, stop! Eric threw out his hands, ready to push the king back, but was knocked out of the way as the bear reared up, dumping the trio to the ground and lunging forward, pinning the king to the wall with a single paw. 
Standing on his hind legs, his large head neatly scraping the ceiling, Barry let out a tremendous roar. His lips peeled back to reveal angry yellow teeth. That's not what I meant, Elias wheezed, struggling to return air back to his lungs. You've been changed by magic, haven't you? Barry faltered, his roar subsiding as he removed his paw from the man. Elias pulled himself out of the divot in the wall, sucking in air. The thing within him had sensed the bear's true nature, and somehow he understood why it was stuck in that form. He turned to the arcanist. Come with us. Help us find this tracking mage, and I promise to return your friend to his human state. His goblet of wine slipped from his hands as Atlas's gaze shifted between Barry and the king. Headmaster Wilfred told us he couldn't be changed back again. That old wizard was right about not changing him back with his magic. Elias smiled gently. But I know a few things he doesn't. He stepped around the bear, extending his hand. Will you help us? He could tell the arcanist would need further prompting as the man hesitated to seal the deal. And you'll be handsomely rewarded for your efforts. More than enough to accommodate your luxurious lifestyle. Atlas didn't like feeling backed into a corner, and was about ready to tell the both of them to piss off when Barry gave him a pleading, dewy-eyed look. With a heavy sigh... He thrust his own hand out, grasping the king's in a firm handshake. He could never say no to that face. Fine, fine, I'll help. Good. Elias's grin only grew as he turned to his doppelganger. All right, master of subterfuge, any ideas on how we can sneak back into Avis and steal an airship? We thank you for joining us for this chapter of the novel Of Portals and Portents, book four by Leslie Heron in this ongoing series available here on Tall Tale TV. You can find links in the description to where you can listen to all her books and novellas, with new chapters appearing as they are being written and recorded. Listen, buddy, what do you think you're doing? Mm. I don't care if you cold the bed. You know I need it more than you do. <laughs> oh, right. Just use the floor? You can't even imagine how painful the splinters would be. Trust me, I know. Now get down and let me have it. At least for a while. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Come here. <laughs> yeah, you let go. Take that. <laughs> Ow. Did you fight me? Hold <laughs> still, you let go. <laughs> Well, damn. Now neither of us get it. Mm. You know what? I have an idea. <laughs> All right, everybody. Dog pile. Mm. Like all the sword mm. blades. Mm. Mm. Oh, oh, I suppose that works. Oh, oh my. Mm.